Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. United Airlines. The Northward Center. NJIT. New Jersey Institute of Technology. Fedway Associates. And by Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, this year is the 50th anniversary of that uh, horrific, tragic event. But as part of our ongoing recognition of Dr. King, we feature interviews with people who knew him, who marched with him, who were side by side, shoulder to shoulder with him. Uh, one of those people, Edith Savage Jennings. I sat down with, with her and, uh, and she talked about a relationship with Dr. King, with Coretta Scott King, what kind of man he really was, what kind of leader he was, and why the civil rights movement um, was changed dramatically because of Dr. King. Um, Edith Savage Jennings passed in late 2017, but this interview is as important today as ever. Here's that conversation. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Uh, it is our honor and our pleasure to introduce the young lady you're about to see on camera. She is uh, Edith Savage Jennings. She is a civil rights icon. Right. Um, born in? Jacksonville, Florida. Came to New Jersey um, when you were two? Two. To Trenton. Right. You were extremely close to Dr. Martin Luther King. How close? Well, I think very, very close. Uh, Daddy King and Mama King adopted me into their family mm -hmm. in 1966. So I can't think I get any closer than that. Yeah. Your involvement in the civil rights movement, be specific, because it is so extraordinary. Well, you let saw me it tell all. you how I got involved. In 1957, Martin had called Reverend S. Howard Woodson. I know you know who Reverend Woodson Absolutely. was. Absolutely. And said that he could not raise any money in the South at all for the movement. And did he know someone that could raise some funds? And he says, I have someone I know can raise some funds. And uh, I'll ask her. So he called me. He says, uh, Edith, would you do something for me? I said, it depends on what it is. I'm marrying in one month. It depends on what it is. He says, well, I have a friend in Atlanta who cannot raise any money for the movement. I said, what movement? Because I inherited Dr. King at that point. And he says, well, he's starting an organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And they just strapped. They don't have any money. So I said, just give me a month. He says, no, we can't wait a month. We need to do this in about mm. two or three weeks. So I said, tell you what I'll do. I'll have a mass rally. But I must have him to be the speaker. And if he's willing to come, then we'll go. And that's how I met Dr. King. We were talking before we got on the air about a PBS documentary that uh, those of us who are connected to PBS are so proud of. Uh, uh, PBS documentary leading up to the um, the March on Washington, which yeah. you happen not to be there only because I, you had I a foot there. injury, as you were telling me. I just saw me. it on television. And, and, I, um, and I was saying to you, it was, it's considered by many to be uh, the greatest speech of the 20th century, and you said that there, you've seen him speak in other situations, Dr. King, where he was even greater. I thought he was greater when he talked about 
the March on Washington for Poor People's Campaign. 1967. 1967. Describe it. Well, what he had said in the private talk to us, that he felt that America needs to get right. Number one, he talked about the wars, and he felt that they needed to come home and take care of their own rather than stay over fighting somebody else's battles all the time, that we needed him at home, the, the, the army rather, at home, mm. to take care of America. And he just went on to say why we ought to have the Poor People's Campaign. And it was all people, yeah. Indians, Hispanic, Italians, we had all kinds of people that were poor and involved. And interestingly, that, that speech was never uh, taped. Um, curious about something. You've been involved in the civil rights movement for many, many years. Right. Long before when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I presented Mrs. Roosevelt the flowers when I was 10 years old. Eleanor Roosevelt? Yes. What? Yes. If you saw the segment that was me at 10 years old, presenting her the flowers. In what year? Well, see, whatever. I'm 90 now. I don't like to say it, but I'm 90. I don't mind. Well, then go back 80 years, and yeah. you were 10 years old, 10 years and you old. were there. Yeah, I was there. With Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, what happened, I like to tell that it's not long. When we were on our way down to Bordentown, New Jersey, my mother was driving, and she says, now let me remind you that you're not supposed to say anything when you present the flowers. And I kept saying, I'm not deaf, I'm not dumb. Why can't I say anything? So I did the usual on behalf of the organization. Then I said, Mrs. Roosevelt, I want to thank you for being so nice to colored people. Well, she loved it. We stayed friends up yeah. until she passed. And you also, uh, at the Capitol Theater in Trenton. Oh, excuse me, in Trenton, you, uh, they did not allow blacks. The second. It was segregated. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you did not accept that. No. And you did what? Well, I was a member of the NAACP youth chapter at the time. And so I said to the advisor, said, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to integrate the theater, yeah. the Capitol Theater. And she said, oh, no way, no way, no way. <laughs> and I says, well, OK, no way. But then I decided I was going to do it on my own. On your with, own? With my friends. David Dinkins, former mayor of New York. That's right. And so we decided. Who actually that we had were history in Trenton. In Trenton. He sure did. Yeah, so on a Saturday we went and we sat downstairs in the second row. Wow. And the usher came and said, You're in the wrong seats. And so David nudged me, he said, You're the spokesman. And so <laughs> I said, No, we're not moving. And we sat there. Yeah. And the manager came and said, You're in the wrong seat, you belong in the balcony. And I said, we're not moving. And we didn't move. We stayed through the whole movie. They didn't call the police, which I was a little concerned that we were probably going to jail. And I had said, wear jail clothes. But we didn't move. And so he didn't come back. He didn't yeah. call the police. So we went back the next Saturday and sat in the same seats to make sure. And you integrated that theater. I integrated that theater. And speaking of integrating things, we're going to show a picture of you and Rosa Parks, yes. who uh, sat on that bus mm -hmm. and refused to give up her seat. And I'm going to ask you something. Uh, fast forward, if you could. Mm -hmm. Civil rights movement today, given um, the events in Ferguson, given the events in <coughs> Staten Island uh, with the Eric Gardner case, given the events across this country involving, uh, and they're not all the same events, but many of those events inv involve uh, African American, either very younger, very young men, um, children, or right. older men, and white police officers. Right. And there are a lot of rallies, protests, civil rights protests. Some call them anti-police protests. What do you see as the biggest difference? Because you have this extraordinary perspective. The biggest difference in the civil rights marches that you experienced and participated in and what you see today? Well, let, let me say this. Number one, I think we're not, we're missing something. I happen to be a mother of a son that I taught when he was 10, that whenever a police officer says anything to you, you say, yes, sir, or no, sir, because they're very irritated because they are the authority. And I taught him that. 
And I just feel that what's happening, parents are not doing the job of talking to their children about who to respect and so forth. Not that it was, he probably was angry for some other reason than the fact he might have said something to him. I don't know. He didn't have a weapon. So therefore, that irritates me. He didn't have one. He could have called for a backup. Mm. And I think that would have solved the problem. But I'm saying that police officers, I worked in law enforcement for 34 years. So I'm well aware of how police react. To are certain... you sensitive to police officers' jobs? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying... No, no are, you, are you sensitive to the job that they have? No, in a, in a, in a way, yes, in a way. I think that I had asked that I went all over asking police chiefs to do the nonviolent training for mm. police officers, which I think is crucial. They need to know. And they never want to accept it. They said, no, we can't afford it, or so forth. But the only answer to all of this is that we do have police officers. They sort of, I, I'm saying, I don't know this to be true. Police officers, when they're taking the exam, then when they get to the physical part of the exam, that they put on a show. <laughs> mm. And they pass. Now, that's another one of the problems, I believe. Uh, before I let you out here, I want to ask you this question about civil rights leaders. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was an extraordinary leader. By the way, from your perspective, what was Dr. King, from your perspective, what was Dr. King's greatest leadership quality? Well, first thing, he was calm. I always felt that he was anointed to do what he did. I called him the 20th century prophet. That's what I called him because that's the way I felt about him. You know, uh, Steve, I lived with Dr. King and Mrs. King. Person lived with them. When I go to Atlanta, I stayed in their home. I'm about the only person I know that stayed there. And uh, I just knew them to be who they really were, loving, kind, parents, loving to each other. And so there was nothing about Dr. King that would ever make me think that he was doing something wrong or that he wasn't right in what he was doing. It's not so much that we were friends, it's because I believe that, mm. deep down in my heart, that he was sincere about what he was doing. Did the civil rights, last question, did the civil rights movement in some ways die in this country when Dr. King was killed in 1968? Well, you know, I have said this, and I guess I maybe shouldn't say it publicly, but I don't know whether it was that all of the leaders that was working with him were frightened that they may be assassinated too. But I just always felt that if somebody had really taken up the mantle to follow what he was doing, that things would have been better today. No one really did, in your opinion. And nobody never took it. We had some leaders, but they never did what I felt they should have done. Edith Savage Jennings. Um, it says here you're a civil rights icon. You're more than that. You are a, an American treasure. And I want to thank you for joining us on thank public you. broadcasting. And I thank you for having me. Okay. This is One on One. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. To see more One on One with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Sivaraman Ambarasan is executive director of New Jersey Community College Consortium for Workforce and Economic Development. Good to see you. Good to, glad to be here. You join us on the, our sister program, Caucus New Jersey, talking about a lot of these issues. By the way, this consortium that we're talking about, uh, who's involved in the consortium and who benefits from it? Yeah, this consortium consists of all the 19 community colleges of New Jersey. Um, the colleges uh, <clears throat> uh, are involved in workforce development activities in addition to college credit courses and programs that you're all familiar with. Uh, so the local businesses and the local uh, citizens benefit from all the programs that we do uh, from the statewide perspective. When you say the programs you do, you're really trying to help people who are struggling right now in terms of employment gain skills and tools, right? Yeah. So give us an example. How does that work? Sure. Um, there are two areas that we uh, help uh, the businesses and the people of New Jersey. 
Uh, one is uh, training incumbent employees, uh, close the skills gap. Um, Department of Labor provides us a lot of funding to do that. Uh, that's one segment of it. Large uh, piece of our uh, work uh, goes in that area. Uh, the second is uh, more important, uh, but it's a smaller uh, area where we help unemployed people get back into uh, gainful employment. And we feel very good about the programs that we have. All these programs are delivered through community colleges in your area. So they are very local, mm. very specific, designed to meet the needs of the employers in the area. You talk about certain areas, um, and you're very customized. Talk about Atlantic City and the fact that so many casinos have closed, uh, thousands of people have lost their jobs. What are you doing down there? We just had an initial meeting, uh, Department of Labor, uh, just received $29 million national emergency grant from the feds. So we just had a planning meeting last week. Uh, we are looking at uh, several uh, industries, um, several um, companies that, uh, that are willing to partner with us. Um, so we have to design um, training programs to meet those uh, open jobs. What do they need? Well, the uh, statistics or the jobs, uh, real-time jobs show that um, there's a need for healthcare, allied healthcare uh, folks in that area. Um, construction workers, uh, there's a demand for that. And uh, professional services, um, accountants, um, you know, uh, engineers, uh, those kind of uh, jobs are available. You also have this uh, mobile classroom. I read about that and I'm thinking, where is this mobile classroom going and, and how do people access it? Yes, uh, that's a very successful program that we initiated about a year ago. Uh, this is specifically addressing the needs of manufacturing companies in New Jersey. Um, as you know, New Jersey is a huge manufacturing uh, base. Uh, there are lots of small manufacturers. These are not very big ones, uh, 25, 50 people uh, companies, and they have a real tough time um, recruiting and uh, retaining qualified technicians. Um, only four colleges <clears throat> in New Jersey have the infrastructure to train and prepare this workforce. So we uh, received a grant from the federal government to create mobile training labs with uh, um, CNC machines, uh, which is what needed in many of these manufacturing companies. So we take these trailers to different areas where manufacturing companies are looking for entry-level technicians, uh, CNC operators. What does CNC mean? Uh, computerized numerical control. Okay. It's a, um, it's a mechanized uh, way of uh, machining. A metal fabrication uh, business needs that uh, skill set. So, so hold on. When people graduate from the program, how do you track their success in terms of finding employment? It's a very good question. Uh, the way that we do this training uh, is a flipped model. Uh, we do the training before, uh, bef we actually, we work with the employers before we do the training. We uh, uh, know who the employers are that are requiring uh, skilled uh, laborers. Uh, and you find we, out what they need? We find out before we begin the training program. Okay. So we then bring them in, into our college. We bring the unemployed people. We have them meet and we select the people that are suitable to work in this shop. And then we do the training. It could be about 12 week training. Uh, we teach the basics of manufacturing, uh, machining. Um, so then employers are constantly involved in the, uh, during the training. And uh, at the end, 90% of the people get jobs. 90%? 90%. 90% get jobs. Across the board in different industries? Well, we have tried this in the manufacturing industry so far, and we are, uh, going to extend the same model into information technology and life sciences uh, through a $10 million grant we just received to help the long-term unemployed. Before I let you have it, I'm curious, in the manufacturing side, we're doing well? We're doing very well. Why is that? I've heard so many things about our, how we're struggling on the manufacturing side. Well, <clears throat> that may be the case, but uh, the New Jersey manufacturers are very niche uh, manufacturing companies. Uh, what they do is uh, make components that go into bigger things. For example? For example, um, we have a, a component manufacturer uh, that, uh, that makes uh, components that go into radars. So and there's a niche for that. There's there, a market there, there for that. There is a very special market. And there's another manufacturer who uh, fixes elevators throughout the country. And these are, you know, he, he, in fact, he, 
he cannot fill the job orders that he has because the demand is so much. Mm. And these are very special niche manufacturing companies and they have this need and they cannot find a reliable, trained uh, workforce and that's where we come in and, and help it's them. It's called the uh, New Jersey Community College Consortium for Workforce and Economic Development. And thank you for joining us and sharing uh, your perspective on this very important issue. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. Glad to be this here. This is uh, One on One. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more One on One with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by Dr. James Lim, Chief of Transplant Surgery at Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to see you, Steve. We've had many conversations offline about uh, this very important subject. <clears throat> you were talking to me, and we've talked about the fact that we work with the Sharing Network right. on organ transplantation. You said we're a victim of our own success? We are. Uh, we've done so well in the field of transplant in a relatively short period of time that more and more people want to get on the transplant list and to get transplanted. The problem is it's a supply and demand issue. The demand is great and the supply is limited and unfortunately people have to wait longer and longer and when they wait longer and longer more people die. What are most people waiting for, doctor? Most people in the United States right now are waiting for a kidney transplant. So there's approximately 123,000 people on the waiting list right now. Uh, the vast majority of which are patients uh, with kidney failure waiting for a kidney transplant. But in our area, the waiting time is around four to five years, so um, it's a long wait for them. And those who are saying right now, well, ah, that's terrible, but I couldn't be a donor, you say what to them? I said, you know what, you don't know until you try. I, I think, like a lot of things, the more passive you are, the less uh, active you are, obviously, in life. And I think, like uh, one of the speakers earlier said, you want to be an active participant mm -hmm. in life. One of our guests actually said that. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you this about saving lives. Because, by the way, get this in terms of numbers. In the United States, uh, we had over 23,000 deceased donors, only 6,000 living donors. Correct. When someone um, <clears throat> gives their donor their, their organs, a deceased donor saves how many lives? Eight lives. Eight. Eight. That's a good ratio. Put that in perspective. Well, I guess the other numbers to throw out, not to be too confusing, every day about 20 people die waiting, just waiting, waiting. to get transplanted. Because not, there's not an organ for them. Correct. Right. Every 10 minutes, someone gets on the waiting list. So if you look back the last 10 years, the number of donors and the number of transplants have actually plateaued, haven't really gone up significantly. Mm. Unfortunately, the only thing that has gone up significantly has been the number of people going on the list. So there's a bigger and bigger gap. Years and years ago, the waiting time was not as long. And now with each year, as we become much more successful with our patient and graft survival, patients want to go on the list. There are more patients going on the list. There are not enough organs. For us in transplant, that's the holy grail, is the availability of a donor organ. Doctor, what is the kidney allocation system? That's a new system that was just enacted December 4th of this past year. Um, before that, basically, when people uh, got a kidney transplant, they had to go on the list. When they got on the list, they started at the very back of the line. Typically, they would have to wait, on average, around four years to get a kidney transplant. Um, as of December 4th, 2014, the waiting time includes not just when they get on the list, but if they've been on dialysis, prior to that, that period of time, which for some patients may be years, is added to their waiting time. So what that means is as, a pa as opposed to getting on the list and waiting for another four or five years, if a patient's been on dialysis prior to coming in for, let's say, four or five years, when they get on the list and get activated, mm. instead of starting at the very back of the line, they actually may be able to skip ahead four or five years. Now, Doctor, I've said this before on the air, so it's, I got my, be okay for my wife to say this. She is donated her kidney, um, and I saw her recover from this. But there are those who are, don't know what the recovery is, they don't know what the process right. is. Describe it. Um, right now we're able to do uh, almost 100% of all the donor nephrectomies where you donate a kidney laparoscopically. 
some people call it minimally invasive, um, but it's much more advantageous for the donor now. Recuperation, depending on what kind of work they do, how uh, strenuous their lifestyle is afterwards, typically they can go back to what they typically do in two to four weeks versus in the past it would probably take at least four to six weeks just to recuperate from the surgery itself when it was an open flank incision. Sure. Right? So, so it, the recovery time is shorter? Much shorter. Uh, could you talk about pancreas? Sure. Um, I think of all the solid organ transplants that we do, that may be the one organ that a lot of people don't think that we can do. But you uh, can. You can, absolutely. Probably more people have heard of islet cell transplant for people with diabetes. But for those with diabetes, a solid organ pancreas transplant may be a better option for them. Uh, typically, these patients are on insulin. Uh, they may have multiple episodes into the emergency room because mm -hmm. they're unable to control their sugars well. Not because they don't do that on purpose, but because of the fact that oh, their diabetes affects them so severely. Doctor, what is the biggest difference between a, a receiving an organ from a living donor versus a deceased donor? Results. Um, the living, the patient who gets a, let's say, deceased uh, donor kidney, that kidney is a very good kidney. We would expect a one-year graft survival, probably around 91%. Mm. For someone who gets a living donor kidney, that one-year graft survival is around 96%. That A minus A may or may not make a difference, but in the long run, makes a big difference, such that at five years, we know that someone who gets a deceased donor kidney, that graft has around a 70% uh, graft survival versus with a living donor transplant, it could be closer to 80% graft survival. Before I let you out of here, how rewarding is your work? Um, as a surgeon versus someone who doesn't operate, uh, we like that more quicker gratification. I think there are very few fields in surgery where you can see someone who's uh, deteriorating on dialysis and then to get a transplant and literally for a lot of people the very next day you just see the look that just it comes back to them. They literally have that second chance at life again and many of them take advantage of it as they should. And those patients you can visualize them. I mean you they're you not do. just a number of you. No, no. And I think that's one of the nice things about our program. They're not number 24 for the month or number 38 for the year. They're Bob Jones, who's married to Mary, who's a teacher, who's been doing all these things that she's had to do because her husband's been on dialysis for the last three to four years. That's powerful. We're very blessed to be able to do that, and it's an honor for us. Uh, Dr. James Lim, who is the chief of transplant surgery at Hackensack University Medical Center, um, it's powerful and uh, it's important. And I want to also thank our friends at the New Jersey Sharing Network for continuing to be out there uh, every day that doing the work they do. They can only do the work they do if you donate, but also you do what you do. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, Choose New Jersey, United Airlines, The Northward Center, NJIT, Fedway Associates, and by Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Highly educated and perfectly located in the heart of the Northeast Corridor, New Jersey provides access to top talent and one of the most concentrated and diverse consumer markets in the world. A business located in central New Jersey has access to more than 22 million consumers within a two-hour drive. Whether it's our strategic location, transportation systems, reliable utilities, or talented workforce, New Jersey has all you need to grow your business. To learn more, visit ChooseNJ.com.